Good morning. Good morning. Uh, I gotta tell you, the weather here is awesome. <laughs> Spending a week in Houston, we had a couple days, and there was no day that it was below 90. A couple days it was 99, and the lowest humidity we had, and it was wonderful, was 70. 70% 70 humidity, but most days it was between uh, 85 and 95. When you walk out, you feel like you're drinking your air. <laughs> um, so when we, you know, it was actually very nice when we got off the plane in Salt Lake. I kind of thought, oh, where's my sweatshirt? And then we got here and I thought, I don't even want my sweatshirt. <laughs> so, um, good week, bad week, not really bad, sad week, I guess. Um, for those of you that know, we went back to Houston to uh, say goodbye to my dad. Uh, <clears throat> doesn't look like he has more than a couple weeks. But he's at peace, you know. Uh, that's that's the best thing I can say. Uh, they had kind of forewarned me. He had lost a lot of weight, and his his mind was a little bit confused sometimes. But uh, I didn't realize he lost all the weight in six weeks. And uh, you know, the nearest thing I can say, you know, you see pictures of Auschwitz. And that's what Dad looks like. Yeah. And uh, but boy, when he was awake, his mind was sharp. And uh, he was with it. We had some good talks. Um, just, just a neat time. Um, and when we left, uh, he said, see you later. Yeah, yeah we will. Yeah. You know? And thank you uh, for the songs. Because that reminds me, you know, this, this isn't the end. By any stretch, this is not the end. Uh, this, this is just a cool transition. So, uh, like I said, in as much as it was, it was a good week. Uh, we'll be leaving probably, you know, after Dad dies, we'll be gone for about a week because we're going to have a memorial service, but we we don't even know when the memorial service will be. But uh, I was really stressed about going down because uh, how do you say goodbye to him? But God took care of it. So it was, it was great. Um, but one thing I, I spent a lot of time thinking about this week, uh, you know, we have no perception of time. We just don't understand time. You know, we got fancy watches and clocks, and you know, I've got one of those clocks that syncs up, you know, every night, and, and it has the exact time. And and but you know, we just don't comprehend time um, because at one and the same moment, I can't believe it was only a week ago that I was standing here. It seems like almost a month, but at the same time, I feel like it was just a day or so ago. And so we just don't grasp it. And you know, that's kind of an encouragement to me because God sees it all, all instantaneously, all at one time. He knows everything that's going on. And uh, you know, it's so cool. The more I get to know of him, the more I get to know him. We serve a really cool God. You know, I mean, he's just awesome. And I, and I, I hate the overuse of that word, awesome, you know? We just use that word so frivolously anymore. Oh, that was an awesome dinner. Oh, that was an awesome game. We don't know what awesome is. So, uh, good week, good to be home. You know, I, I got to spend the week with my family members and, and be there with them, but, uh, you know, this is where God has us. This, this is our, our church family, and it's good to see each other here. So, uh, what a blessing to be here. Thank you. Um, I, uh, I've been a little distracted lately and, uh, I didn't get, um, anyone to do their, their testimony today. So does anyone want to volunteer? <laughs> <laughs> it says be ready, in, in season and out. We're in a season. <laughs> you guys. All right, I'll let you off the hook this time. I was really, I was going to put Cam on the spot. <laughs> <laughs> it's kind of a welcome home kind of. <laughs> okay. Okay, so we are in, does anybody else think it's really warm in here? Would, would it be okay if I turn the fan on? No, I don't, I don't remember if one is high or low. It's you don't even have the heat on at your house. Oh, uh, it came on yesterday. I went and turned it off. <laughs> <laughs> Our windows are open. Yep, yeah, the windows open. I walked by. What is that sound? 
it has the heater. So I turned it off. <laughs> and all the women were wrapped up in blankets. <laughs> um, <clears throat> we are in Colossians 3. And I, I'm, I'm going to apologize. Well, I'm going to apologize for two things. One, I am really sorry for the way I'm dressed. There was a miscommunication and my laundry did not get done, so I have to wear a monkey suit, so I'm sorry. <laughs> All right, I'll be back in my regular clothes next week. <laughs> hopefully. Hopefully laundry will be done by then. Um, so otherwise I'll be wearing Thaddeus' clothes. <laughs> but, um, you know, I really thought that we would be up close to chapter 4, if not in chapter 4 right now. Um, but I feel like you know, the, the fruit that Paul is listing here is reiterated over and over and again throughout Scripture. And I feel like, you know, when you're in school, they always tell you, if the teacher repeats something, make note of it, write it down, because it'll be on the test. And I do kind of the same thing in Scripture. When I see it repeated in other places, I make note of it. But when you see it repeated over and over and over again, as often as we have these lists, these attributes, these characteristics of a Christian, it's important. And I, I was talking with Christy earlier this week because I, my goal today was to get through, um, I think I was going through humility and, uh, let me see, meekness and patience. And I felt like I was doing a, a disservice by trying to rush through them. So, uh, we'll see how far we get, but I'm, I'm thinking, hopefully today, we'll get to cover humility. And I told Christy, I said, I'm really struggling because there is so much in God's Word about being humble. And we oftentimes just fly over that. You know, in America, we don't like to be humble. You know, um, rugged independence doesn't lend itself to humility, you know. Uh, we tend to associate humility with weakness. Um, and we're, we're going to talk about weakness next week when we deal with meekness because the two are not the same thing. And actually, going through this, this list, the world wants to put all of these things as a sign of weakness. You know, compassionate heart, kindness, humility, meekness, and patience. It wants us to look at those things as, as being weak. I mean, uh, which of the guys ever on The Apprentice made it ahead with those kind of attributes? You know, who on Survivor made it to the end by being meek? Nobody. And, and those are not the characteristics that we ascribe to in this society. And so, looking at humility, there was a, a number of things. And, and quite honestly, I'm not even going to try and hit all of the scriptures that deal with humility. Because the, the opposite, in opposition to humility, is the thing that we struggle with, that we're confronted with day in and day out, and that's pride. But first, let's, let's get a working definition of humility. What is humility? Um, dictionary says, a modest or low view of one's own importance. Humbleness. Now, how come they use the word to describe the word? I thought you weren't allowed to do that. Humbleness is to be... Okay. Um, the synonyms are modesty, humbleness, meekness, diffidence, unassertiveness. The antonym is pride. The etymology of the word, it comes from the Latin word humilitas, which is um, translated humble, but it means grounded, or from the earth, or low, like, like down here, okay? Uh, not like dirt, just like positionally, okay? Um, in scripture, we see the word, and I'm not even going to try and say the word. It, it's got like eight parts to it, and I'm not even going to try and say it, because if I do, I'm going to butcher it. And you guys aren't going to understand it anyway. As far as I know, does anybody in here speak Greek? Okay, so we're good. Um, but it, it means um, having an opinion of oneself that is the moral littleness and modesty. It's... it's the best way to describe it in, in the Greek is translated lowliness of mind. Okay? Um, Charles Spurgeon made this comment and when somebody asked him about humility. He said, uh, the best definition I have ever met with is to rightly think of ourselves 
Humility is to make a right estimate of oneself. Now, one thing I want to address before we really get into what God has to say about this is humility is not saying, oh, I'm not talented. You know, um, Cam, I'm going to use you as an example just because you're an easy target because you're here and gone. You know, <laughs> that'd be like Cam saying, oh, I'm no good at baseball. Or I'm no good at hockey. Or for Mike to say, oh, I'm not really very good at cabinet making. Well, that's a lie. Because they are. Okay? That's not humility. That's false humility. Okay? Humility is understanding that what you're good at is what God has given you. That it's not of any innate something of yourself. It's something God has given you. And we can improve on those things. You know? Um, I don't know, would you work out maybe 30 minutes a month or so when you're playing ball? You know? I mean, how often did you work out? Every day. Every day. Every day. Why? To get better. To get better. Yeah. At least do not get worse. Okay? But humility is not this false sense of I can't do anything. It's an understanding of what you can do is only because God has given you. Okay? It's rightly understanding position. Rightly understanding position. I have a term that I, I use for this, okay? Inestimable trash. T H A T. Inestimable. As in beyond value. Okay? Invaluable trash. Okay? And you guys are looking at me like, what? Okay, you've heard the saying, you know, oh, one man's trash is another man's treasure. Uh, okay, I'm, I'm the trash guy, and there are others that are the treasure people. And we, we talked about this before. I look at something and go, <laughs> garbage. And somebody else looks at something and goes, oh, no, a little bit of work and centerpiece. Okay, and I commend you for that because I can't do it. Okay, now, I'm the stupid one that lets you put all the work in and then I pay ten times as much to put it in my center. Um, but inestimable trash... You know, Romans tells us that everyone has sinned. Every one of us. Every one of us. And there is none of us that is righteous. Okay? We are profane. Now, what is our working definition of profane? The word literally means outside of the temple. Okay? Not holy. Okay? So, we're, we're kind of like... Um, you know, the whole group of, of peer-pressured wannabes that, that just all gets together and nobody ever does anything different because the group always does the same thing. We're profane. You know, in and of ourselves we have no value because we, we can't even come into the presence of God in the condition we're in. That's trash. That's trash. But at the very same time, God has given us a value beyond all things. Because God has determined for us to be valuable. God has sent His Son so that we could become holy. So that we could be separate. So that we could be a people unto Him. He has given us the, this, this manner in which we no longer are the wannabes. We are the haves, not the have-nots. Okay, inestimable trash. Because what do I have to offer God that's of any value before me? What do I have that's going to impress Him? Really. What can I do to impress God? And yet, still, from His throne, He looks down and says, I want Him. He's mine. I value Him. Because, let's, let's go back. What's the first verse everybody learns? Keep in mind, we learn this verse and we almost become callous to it. But I want you to listen to what it says. John 3.16 For God, the supreme ultimate being in the universe, the holy of holies, there is nothing more holy than me. <coughs> so loved. His heart was filled with compassion. We talked about that last week, having a compassionate heart. So loved. The world not talking about 
to planet Earth. That's an entirely different Greek word. This is a concept that talks about the population of, the populace of, the people, the peopling of this planet. God so loved the world, okay, that he gave his only son. Okay? That whosoever believes would not die but have everlasting life. In estimable trash. God has looked in, you know, there's another passage that talks about many objects in a house, some for noble purpose and some for ignoble purposes. I was an ashtray. Okay? Or maybe a spittoon. I don't know. It was definitely ignoble. But God is taking me and he's rubbing me and he's cleaning me and he's going to make something cool out of me. I don't know what it looks like. He's the master creator. He's the designer. He's the potter. He's going to make of me whatsoever he wills that I will become an object of value in his house. And that's what he's doing with all of us. He's taking those ignoble objects and he's making something noble of them. You know? Whether it be, you know, have, have you ever seen porcelain that's so thin it's almost like eggshell? I mean, that, and it's, uh, I bet you you've never touched it. Because that stuff is expensive. Because it's valuable. You know? It's, it's, it's priceless. You know? I, I don't even have, you know, this, this is as much gold as I have in my house. <laughs> except for what's on Christie's finger. Okay? I don't, we don't have gold objects in our house. You know, our, our stuff tends to functionality. Um, but, but God's house is full of uh, priceless things that he's taken and he's wrought into noble purposes, things of noble purposes, okay? Some flower vases, some picture frames, some whatever, okay? So inestimable trash. So the first thing we need to understand is, you know, it's not a downer, it's an upper because where we start down, God brings us up. So humility is not lying to yourself about what you can and can't do, that's false humility. But it's understanding that in and of yourself, you have nothing of value to offer him. It's he that gives the value to you. Okay? And in whatever way. And you know, we talked about some talents, but there's other things. You know, um, people that are just good people. You know, uh, Mother Teresa. Do you really think without God's presence in her life, she would have been Mother Teresa? She would have been like Sister Therese. Or something, you know. She she would not have been who she was. God brings about such marvelous things in us. So let's take a look. Let's go into God's word and take a look at some things. And I've, I've just kind of jotted down some areas that I think kind of lays this out. Okay. First, what is God's view of humility? Now, keep in mind, humility and humiliation have the same root, but we're not talking about humiliation. Okay. Humiliation is going to go with pride. Okay. And we're going to see a little bit of that here in a minute. We're, we're talking about being humble, having a humble heart. So, um, first note. God wants you humble. Why does God want you humble? Well, we'll talk about that in a minute. But I want to wrap up with that. Okay. But, but if you're not humble, what are you? You're proud. You know, uh, Proverbs 3.34. Toward the scorners he is scornful, but to the humble he gives favor. Hmm. Don't, you don't have to turn there. We're going to get to a couple passages that I'll have you turn, but while I'm just hitting these short verses, I don't bother turning. 1 Peter 5.5 5 says, Likewise, you who are younger, be subject to the elders. Clothe yourselves, all of you, with humility toward one another. For God opposes the proud, but gives grace to the humble. God opposes the proud. Now, the word is an active word. It's not passive. Okay? It's not like, um, let's see, I need a volunteer. Mm, I don't want Cam. He's bigger than me. Um, all right, Cam, come here. Yeah, he's never going to come back. Okay. So. That's right. He's going to sit up against the wall, huh? All right. So, Cam, you're just going to walk that way. Okay, back up first. Quick. Back up first. We've got, we got to have running room. Okay, you're just going to walk this way. Okay, this is not resisting the proud. Go ahead, walk. You know, you probably shouldn't go that way. That's not really a good thing to do, but okay, go ahead. Okay, now walk back this way. Okay, this is God resisting the proud. Okay? It's an active verb. It's not passive. It means that he is actively against you. Thank you. 
Uh, all right. Yeah, I was going to tackle him, but I thought I might crease my pants. So, um, we need to understand God is not only, you know, unhappy with pride. He resists it. He moves against it. What is the first sin that we know of committed? Historically, what was the first sin committed? Pride. Well, what, what happened? Satan said, I will exalt myself. Ah, Satan, I will exalt myself above the heavens. I will seat myself on the throne of God. Pride. I am, I want to be more than I am. I deserve more. See, pride. So from the beginning, pride has set itself against the heart of God. Okay? I personally believe that pride is at the root of every sin you will commit. Because you feel like you deserve something else. Something better. Okay? You know, Paul tells us, what do you have that God did not give you? So if God gave it to you, why do you act as though he did not? You know, that's, that's the root of pride. Oh, I, oh, I want this, I want that, because I deserve it. You know, this is a, an attitude that is rampant in America. Okay? It, it's running throughout America, because we have people that have given up working, they just don't work anymore because the government is going to take care of them. Why? Because they deserve to be taken care of, because they're Americans. Uh, I, I don't understand that. Um, you know, I, I come from a family that, that were workers. Um, Dad made sure we were workers. You know, um, we had school during the week. You had chores in the evening, you had uh, weekend chores on Saturday, and Dad had special projects on Sunday. I hated it when we pulled up after church and the garage door was open. <laughs> how many of you ever mopped your garage? <laughs> Seriously, how many of you ever mopped it? <laughs> Monthly. <laughs> and everything had to come out of the garage and be cleaned off, and then the garage had to be mopped, and everything had to go right back in the same position it was. Because my dad is also very melancholy, and he doesn't like change. So we would... Oh, I hate that. Or we'd come home, and dad would be standing outside with a pair of gloves. <laughs> what are we tearing apart this time? Or what are we building this time? My dad was a worker, okay? Um, church started at 9.30. I don't think we were ever there before 8.30. Because my dad wanted to set up chairs. We lived in Denver. Denver gets a lot of snow sometimes. And we would stand at the end of the block because cars would come off of the main street and our street wasn't plowed, so they'd get stuck. And so we would get there whatever time Dad decided we needed to get there, depending on the amount of snow, and we would shovel the path all the way down and then we'd go stand at the end of the block. And when the cars would get stuck, we'd run out and push them so they could come to church. My dad was a worker and he taught each of his kids to be workers. Okay? So I don't understand when people go, I deserve for being. Okay? No. You work. You earn. Okay? So, pride. God resists the proud. He's actively opposing you. Now, how does that work with Christians? God disciplines those he loves. He brings you down. Sometimes, gently, hey, hey, you shouldn't do that. And if you listen, take it from me. Listen the first time. Okay? Because if you don't listen the first time, he gets louder. And then things start changing to being uncomfortable. And then things can get downright ugly. Because, you know, how many of you have ever listened to Keith Green? Okay. Uh, we used to get his uh, magazine, uh, his last day's magazine. And um, one of the articles that he wrote is, he, he made a comment that, that has stuck with me for, oh gosh, a lot of years. And he said, and I, I don't know if he's quoting someone else. I'm quoting Keith Green because he's the one I read. God is more interested in your holiness than he is in your happiness. Okay? Because your happiness does nothing before his throne. But your holiness will. Now, understanding it's his holiness that's given to us. Okay? But, but when, when we come in and go, oh, wow, wow, give me my binky. I want my binky. 
wow, 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 my binky. My, my poor granddaughter doesn't want her binky, she wants her thumb. And, and, but how often are we like that? Wow, 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 give me my binky. And what, what good parent continues to give their child their binky at the point, I mean, I had a, a nephew that had a binky up until he went to school. I'm not kidding, kindergarten. He had his binky. And uh, would God be being a good parent if he kept giving us our binky? No. Okay, so God is actively opposed to the proud. All right, so let's, let's look at some other scriptures. Let's see what else he has to say. <clears throat> Luke, let's turn to Luke. Luke chapter 14. Luke chapter 14, I'm going to start in verse 7. Now we're actually, this is kind of in the middle of something that's happened. Jesus is, has uh, uh, already, something's going on. We're not interested in really what's happened at this point. I want you to see what comes out of it, okay? So verse 7, he says, Now he told a parable to those who were invited, when he noticed how they chose the places of honor, saying to them, When you are invited by someone to a wedding feast, do not sit down in a place of honor lest someone more distinguished than you be invited by him. And he who invited both will come and say to you, give your place to this person, and then you will begin with shame to take the lowest place. But when you are invited, go and sit in the lowest place, so that when your host comes, he may say to you, friend, move up higher. Then you will be honored in the presence of all who sit at the table with you. For everyone who exalts himself will be humbled. And he who humbles himself will be exalted. Now think about this for a moment, okay? If, if you will. What is the point of being proud? Of seeking to have it your way? I mean, isn't the point really to have the adulation of either others or yourself, to feel good about yourself, or so that others will look at you and go, ooh, I'm in the same room as that person, okay? Really, isn't that really the point of this? I mean, you know, we come in and we park at the highest seat of honor. And what shame when they say, <laughs> you're in the back row. You, you got moved. Okay? See, this is the whole point of being humble. See, that's, that's humiliation right there. When you put yourself in a position that is not yours, and you have to be slapped down to go to the position that is yours. Okay? That's humiliation. Humility is when you come in and say, I'm going to start here. Not coming in and saying, I'm going to start here so they can move me up. Because <laughs> I know I'm going up there. <laughs> that's, that's not, I mean, that's just, see, that's, that's false humility. Because your goal is to end up where you want to be anyway. But if you come in, let them move up. Now, we're going to see the same thing, okay? Uh, we see, uh, I just read the passage says, God resists the proud, but he gives grace to the humble. We're going to see some other things as we move forward with this. Um, Second Corinthians 5.17, don't, don't turn there. Um, we've been talking about in the last couple of weeks, actually, it was about three or four weeks ago, we talked about the old man and the new man, the new creation. And, and how we have sins and, and fruit that mark us as, as not his, and we have fruit that marks us as his. And that's kind of the whole point of what we're doing here, right? Um, now, when we come to Christ, 2 Corinthians 5.17 says, Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, he is a new creation. The old has passed away. Behold, the new has come. Okay? Now, we talked about this a couple weeks ago. How, how do you know an apple tree is an apple tree? Okay? Now, I know there's some of you that can walk in and you can look at the tree and go, oh, yeah, that's a Honeycrisp. That's a Macintosh. I walk in and I go, that's a tree. <laughs> that's another tree. Okay? 
And then when the apples come up, I go, that's an apple. That's a different apple. Okay. And I know there's somebody that can do that, but really, um, none of us has the experience of all of this. So how do we know what kind of tree it is? And we know it by what fruit it bears. Okay. Uh, I remember when I worked on the, the maintenance crew in college, we had this huge oak grove down at the bottom of the tree, the school. And they used to get these vines that would grow up. And these vines were thick. I mean, they're like this. And they'd grow up and they'd get up and they'd start choking the tree and the tree would start having weird things happen to it. And, and uh, they would tell us periodically, okay, you guys need to go pull these vines down. Now, these vines were not like pretty vines with the, the, you know, cool leaves and stuff. These things were just like thick kind of rope that had prickles on them. And they just kept growing and growing and growing. And you'd go down with thick leather gloves and they'd go right through your gloves and stick your fingers. And we hated that job. Because you go down and you try and pull them off, and they would actively resist you. They're clinging to the tree. They're like, no! <laughs> you know? We learned a, a, an interesting trick very early on in this. I wish somebody had showed us at the start, but no, they're just like, oh, go pull the vines. You know what you do? You know the easiest way to get rid of them? You come out with a machete, and you get right down at the base of the vine, and you go, whack! And you wait a week. And you come back, and the vine is dead. And you grab it, and you just go, poop! and it falls right off. I wish we had learned that right at the start, because I spent a lot of time going, ah! <laughs> they, they wasted their money on me doing that. Okay? But how do you know what kind of plant it is by the fruit that it bears? Now, when we come to Christ, we are a new creation. We are created anew in His image. Okay? We talked last week. Why are these things important? Why does God want these things in us? Why? Because we are to be representative of Him to this world. Alright? And if we come to this world and try and profess Christ to them, but we have the same attitude of pride that they do, we're not really offering them anything. Because they've already got what we have. If we come with an attitude of humility... Then we have something entirely different, something they don't get. And they won't get until God's Spirit is We didn't get it. We didn't get it before. We didn't understand it. God's Spirit births it in us, and it grows in us. That's part of the fruit. Remember we talked about, you know, we're, we're the branch that's stuck into the vine, and when His life flows into us, the fruit grows. Okay? So if we're stuck into the vine, the fruit should be growing. Now... You know, like I told you a while ago, some of my fruit's really small. The kindness fruit. Not as good as some of the others. I'm working on that, and I'm letting God work on me in that. I'm letting Him try and teach me what kindness is. Okay? Humility. I was going to bring you my plaque this morning and show my plaque off to you. <laughs> yeah, you guessed it. My freshman year in college, where they always did, at the end of the year, they'd do the Fruit of the Spirit Awards. And they'd give you a little plaque. And Christy, what, what did you win? Patience. Patience. She, obviously, she's still with me. <laughs> <laughs> so she, she, her, we, we keep her front and center. What do you do when they give you a plaque that says humility? <laughs> I mean, really. Where am I going to hang it? Oh, you're humble. Yeah, right. And they put that down. That's not even... Like, you know, that's, that's, I, somebody was had it out for me. <laughs> so what do you do with that? Okay, so when we come to him, we're a new creation, all right? So we are stuck into the vine. New life is flowing into us. We should start seeing the stickers and the thorns falling off, fading away, and fruit start growing. Something that makes that vine valuable, that branch valuable, okay? I haven't seen anyone give a lot of money for stickers. But I've seen people pay a lot of money for huckleberries. Okay? So let's look again. Let's see what's going on here a little bit further. Galatians 2.20 says, I have been crucified with Christ. It is, I no longer, it is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. And the life I now live in the flesh, I live by faith in the Son of God who loved me and gave himself for me. Now I could do a whole message just on this, but I'm not going to today. Okay? We come to Christ. Okay? We come to Christ to die. That we might have new life. New life. 
Okay? There are no zombies in the kingdom of God, but there's a lot of zombies in church. I mean, I'm not talking about, you know, like uh, World War Z or, or those kind of things. What I'm talking about is, you know, before Christ we are dead. And we come to Christ, we have life. There's a lot of people that come to church that don't have Christ, therefore they have no life. They're the walking dead. Okay? They're zombies and they sit in the chairs in churches all across the world. And the scripture says they have a form of godliness, but they deny its power. They know the songs. They know when to stand up. They know when to sit down. They know the prayers. They know the proper words to say at the proper time. But they're dead. Scott coined a phrase uh, years ago that I, I love, posers. They're posers. It's the dead acting like they're alive. Okay. My grandfather, uh, had his best friend, was a, a mortician. Kind of creepy, right? Uh, but they used to go, on Friday nights they would go down to the dead place and they'd play dominoes. <laughs> And uh, they were playing dominoes, and there was a body prep for services the next day. It was in a casket, and uh, they're playing dominoes. And you know, when when muscles contract and do weird things, the bodies can do weird things. And my grandpa was playing dominoes, and the body sat up. I don't think they played there after that. <laughs> but see, that that's the dead simulating life. Okay, when we come to Christ, the dead have to die so that we can have new life. We can have new life. We can bear fruit. Okay? Now, I say those things to point out to you that you cannot come to Christ with any pride. Okay, Because if you come to Christ with pride, you're trying to bring something to impress Him. And like I said a while ago, what do you have that's going to impress Him? You know? Hey, I'm a self-made millionaire. Please, it's all His. If He wants it back, He'll get it. You know, You're a steward. It's on loan. Hey, I won the, you know, I won the state championship in football when I was in high school. You know how many state championships there are in high school? Well, at least 50 a year. So, you know, okay, did that impress him? No. I mean, really, what do we have that's going to impress him? So when we come to the cross, it has to be with a right understanding of who we are and our position before him. Part of that is an understanding who he is. Okay? I mean... We can't come with the understanding that he's kind of this neat historical figure. We can't really come with the understanding that he's uh, uh, a guy from history that said some really cool things. We have to, you know, we're, we're really limited on how we can view Jesus. Okay? Um, I think... Oh, Christopher's not here. Um, I think it was Josh McDowell that, that said... Uh, he's either a liar, a lunatic, or he's Lord. Those are your three Lewis. options. What's that? C.S. Lewis. C.S. Lewis. That's right, because Josh McDowell was quoting him. Um, and it was, he was quoting him in More Than a Carpenter. But I don't remember where C.S. Lewis was. I think it was uh, Mere, Mere Christianity. Christianity. Yeah. Okay, so either he lied about who he said he was, or he's absolutely crazy making the statements that he did, or he is who he said he was, Lord. Okay? Those are your only three choices. And if you come to him with any understanding other than he is Lord, you're in trouble. You will maintain zombie status. Okay? You won't have new life. Okay? Because he is Lord. Just because he is. All right? That's significant. You have to understand what I'm saying here. He's Lord because of who He is. He's the one that made it all. He's the one that put it all in place. He's the one that keeps it all together. It's all His. He is Lord. Now, He's Savior because of what He's done. Okay? Now, He's only Savior to the few. Scripture says that the way is narrow and few find it. Okay, so there's only a few that he is Savior of. But he is Lord of all. You don't get to choose that. That's not your choice. That's just who he is. That's like saying, I'm going to choose not to breathe oxygen. Mm -hmm. 
<laughs> this is great. It doesn't work. Ooh, I did it. <laughs> okay? You can't choose that. You can choose to reject the reality of it, just like you can choose not to breathe. It won't go well for you. It won't go well for you. Okay? But if you come to the cross and you understand the right position of you and him, there will be new life. You will be infused with new life. Okay? So let's, let's, let's look here. Coming to the cross. We have to come with humility to the cross. Um, okay? We've come to the cross. We're stuck. We're into the bind. Alright? New life is flowing through us. What should happen? Growth and maturity, right? I mean, how many of you guys like like have like gardens? I mean, I know Dennis does because he was just talking about it this morning, and we've gotten a lot of good things out of it. I, I know the roads do because we got a lot of stuff out of theirs. Hey, why are you guys still growing strawberries? I thought that quit like in June. They had a lot of strawberries. Um, when when new life is coming in there, do you see new life once you put the seed in the ground? Yes. Do you, you see it right when you put the seed in the ground? No. No. What happens? You gotta water it. And you gotta wait. You gotta let the sun do its work, and and then you know a little sprout comes up. Okay. All right. Yeah, we're gonna have corn tonight. No, you're not. Okay. So then it grows up. It, it's, man, that's a foot and a half tall. Maybe corn tonight. No. Four foot, five foot, six foot. All right. Six foot tall. We're gonna have corn. No. What happens? It's got to grow, it's got to produce, it's got to bring that fruit forth, right? Okay, now, when we become Christians, automatically there's going to be some changes in our lives. Just because we're infused with God's Spirit, He's sealed us, He's inside of us, we're going to see some changes instantly. That's like the new growth, okay? But all too often we stop there. It's like a garden, the third week of May, we got all these little sprouts, but we never go any further. And 50 years later, we still have little sprouts. See, we have to move on into maturity. Let's talk about some things about maturity here. Matthew 20. Go ahead and turn there. This, this is a few verses. We'll take some time to read this. So Matthew chapter 20, uh, the story starts in verse 20, but I'm, I'm just going to kind of fill you in. Uh, we'll pick it up in verse 25. This is uh, James and John getting ready to offend all the disciples. Okay. Hey, Jesus. Well, in this version, it's their mother, dear old mom. Jesus, I have a request of you. Okay. What you need? Well, I, I want my two sons, you know, those two. Yeah, I, I know. I want them to, to sit at your right and left hand in your kingdom. Okay. Uh, well, you know, no. It's not my place to give. I don't have that authority. Says, uh, he, he tells them, you know, do, do you even know? Can you drink of the cup that I'm going to drink? Well, sure, pass it over. <laughs> yes, we'll be able to do that. And he says, you, you will drink, but uh, it's not mine to give. So, so we're going to jump down. Well, 24, now this is kind of funny, verse 24, says, And when the ten heard it, they were indignant at the two brothers. <laughs> hey, how's Peter's spot on the right and mine on the left? What do you guys think? What, are you trying to get in there? I mean, it's already established. We took a boat. <laughs> They're offended. Okay, now, we really don't understand the positions at the table because we, we really don't have that so much. We kind of sit with um, our friends. We sit wherever. I mean, we don't have a position at a table where we go, oh, this is the head of the table and this is the foot of the table. We got one end of the table. I keep as far away from the kitchen as possible and Christy keeps as close to it as possible. That's the way it works in our house. 
Mm -hmm. um, except when I'm eating cereal, then I sit right next to the kitchen. <laughs> that's right, Kenzie, that's my spot, right? And everybody knows, don't sit there. If Dad has a bowl of cereal, move. Okay? We don't really understand the significance of what's going on here, but this is big stuff. That's why they're offended. Okay? Because this, this is kind of asserting primacy, order. All right? In verse 25, but Jesus called to him and said, You know that the rulers of the Gentiles lord it over them, and the great ones exercise authority over them. It shall not be so among you. Listen to that. It shall not be so among you. Okay? But whoever would be great among you must be your servant. And whoever would be first among you must be your slave, even as the Son of Man came not to serve, or not to be served, but to serve and to give his life as a ransom for many. See, this is what we are called to in the body of Christ, to be the servant, to be the slave, to be the bond servant. Why? This is what he has modeled for us. This is the direction that he requires of us. As a matter of fact, there are other parables, and you guys can look them up later. Feel free. I mean, just start whizzing through some of the Gospels. It's good for you. You know, oh, you know, you've got the, the bad steward. You've got the one that owed a great debt and was forgiven a great debt and then goes out and shakes down somebody that owed him pennies on the dollar. And, and you know, we see bad <coughs> servants we're not called to be bad servants. We are called to be good servants. We are called to serve. Okay? We are called to put our position, ourselves in a position to be of service to others. So you want to grow in Christ. Don't think more highly of yourself than you ought. How high should you think of yourself? Inestimable trash. I got nothing, but he made me everything. He gave me everything. Not because of me, but because of him. Okay? Get a right understanding of who you are and what he has done for you. Keep that. Hold it. Keep it close. Stick it on your mirror so that whenever you look there, you realize. Whether you get up in the morning and you go, oh yeah, good hair day. Or whether you get up in the morning and you go, oh, still no hair. <laughs> I do that. <laughs> because see, each of those is going to bring you back to the understanding that of yourself you have no value, but he has given you tremendous value. You are of great worth in his sight. And he gave you that hair. You didn't do anything to deserve it. <laughs> 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 okay, let's look at the end. All right, a couple more passages. Um, actually, I just I just quoted this. So Philippians two three. Paul writing to the church of Philippi, and he says, "Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves." Do you really have that position? Do you really look at others and count them as being of more importance than yourself? So you can't be a good servant if you feel like you're the one that should be served. Jesus illustrates this with a parable, a, a, a story. He says, you know, which of you, um, which servant, after working a day in the field, would come home and expect to be seated down at the table and have his master serve him dinner? Wouldn't you rather come home and serve the master his dinner, and when he is done, he will tell you, well done, go and feed yourself. Okay. See, that's the attitude we have to say. We have this idea. It's a one and done. Oh, I did a good thing. All right, reward me. Did you see that? Okay. Check out the first part of that passage again. Do nothing from what? Selfish ambition. Selfish ambition or conceit. You know that guy on the street corner that just slipped a couple bucks and then told God, hey, hey, I'm good? He wasn't impressed. The guy on the corner probably wasn't impressed either. Okay. But 
if you're looking to impress God by what you do, you're doing it for the wrong motives. Okay? You're doing it because you're called to do it. That's who you are. That's your nature. When you are stuck in the vine, that is the nature that should flow out from you to be a servant. To serve. Whatever capacity. And people serve in different ways, right? Right? I mean, dear Vivian over here, she's a prayer warrior. And she serves by lifting you guys up before the throne day in and day out. Praying and praying and praying. Steve, Matthew, their servers that actually go out and do the physical labor. I mean, this church is held together because of them. Right? All that beautiful work over there. Um, product of them putting, Steve, putting that up today or so that we could enjoy it today. That's a servant's heart. <coughs> Those people over teaching Sunday school. You know they'd rather be in here listening to me, right? Uh. <coughs> I, I'm, it amazes me how many people sign up to go over there. Okay? We all serve. But the, the point is, it's not necessarily where you're served that's important. It's that you serve. Right? It doesn't matter if you're serving in the field or in the house. You serve. Right? Two more passages that I want to share with you. John 13. Turn over there with me if you would, please. I said earlier that God wants us to have these fruits because we are His representative. We need to represent Him. Okay? We need to look like Him. We need to show the world what He looks like. So John chapter 13, verse 1, it says, Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that His hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved His own who were in the world, He loved them to the end. Man, that's cool. During supper, when the devil had already put into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things in his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper, he laid aside his outer garments, and taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin, and began to wash the disciples' feet, and to wipe them down with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean, but not every one of you. Okay? For he knew who was to betray him, and that was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet, and put on his outer garment and resumed his place. He said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord. You catch that? Lord. And you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example that you, should, that you also should do just as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. If you do them. See, everything that we need, all truth that we need is in this book. The example is laid before us. Okay. Now, we know the story, um, you know, the, they wore sandals, they had dirt roads. As a result of those two things, dirt roads, saddle feet, equals dirty feet. Okay? And when they came into the house, it would be the servant's job to wash their feet. Why? They didn't want stuff tracked all over the house. Okay, so they would wash their feet. And when you have the Lord of the house bending down and washing your feet, it was unheard of. It, it was it was unheard of. Okay? And Jesus not only does this, but he says, this is the example I have set for you. If I have done this to you, you have to do it to each other. Don't just listen to me. Do as I do. 
Don't have the audacity to point the finger at others and say, you're not doing if you're not doing. Do. Do. Set aside pride. Set aside the thought that you deserve anything. What do we deserve? The cross. Anything that He gives us beyond that, what a blessing. What a blessing. You think, how is being a servant a blessing? He's given you life. Eternal life. He has taken away from you the blood guilt of your sin. He has taken away the offense, the affront before God Almighty. Get a right understanding. That's humility. Understanding who He is, who you are. Inestimable trash. And serve. Why? Because He served. Because that's what He wants of us. That's what the Master has called. One more passage and we'll wrap up. Uh, turn with me if you would. Uh, Philippians chapter 2. chapter 2, verse 3. Paul is writing, he says, Do nothing from selfish ambition or conceit, but in humility count others more significant than yourselves. We covered that a little bit earlier. But let's carry on and let's see how he fills out this thought. Okay? Let each of you look not only to his own interests, but also to the interests of others. Okay? There's practical. Have this mind among yourselves, which is yours in Christ Jesus, who, though he was in the form of God, did not count equality with God a thing to be grasped. Do you get that? See, this is one of those things that I look at when people start trying to explain to me the Trinity. It's a mystery, people. We don't understand how three personalities can be one. Well, short of bad things happening in a person's life, but God the Father, God the Son, God the Holy Spirit. It's not something to be grasped. God has not revealed to us everything there is to know about God. Why? Because our heads would explode. we got little tiny brains. Okay? But emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men, and being found in human form, he humbled himself. Now, now look at this for a minute. I want to back up because this is important. He says, but emptied himself by taking the form of a servant, being born in the likeness of men. So, so he comes to earth as a man. But he doesn't come to earth as a man like a position that he would be entitled to because, I mean, really, he could have booted Caesar. And even that would have not been his true worth. Okay? He, that was definitely within the scope of who he is. But he doesn't do that. He comes in the form of a servant. And being found in human form, he doesn't stop there. He humbled himself by becoming obedient to the point of death, even death on the cross. Now see, that's obedience. That's obedience. You know? I mean, Jesus in the garden of Gethsemane the night before. God, if there is any other way, let this cup depart from me. But not my will, your will. Even death on a cross. But it doesn't end there. Okay, it doesn't end there. Because, I mean, that would be like keeping him up there. It goes on, it says, Therefore, God has highly exalted him and bestowed on him the name that is above every name, so that at the name of Jesus, 
Every knee should bow in heaven and on earth and under the earth, and every tongue confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of God the Father. Now, there's a bunch of things in the scripture that I want to point out, but I'm only going to hit a couple. One, when he came, he came to serve. Okay? So when you come, you come to serve. That's what's modeled, that's what's required. When you come, you come to serve. Two, obedience is a requirement, not an option. Okay? Obedience, even in the uncomfortable things, even in the ugly things. Because it's not going to end at ugly. It doesn't end at ugly. Because three, God will lift you up. God will lift you up. Now, you can suffer the adulation and the applause of man through this life. But when you're dead, it's done. It's done. It's over. There will be no more clapping. There will be no more cheering. There will be no more hurrahs. Or you can take on the very nature of Christ himself and forego the adulation, oftentimes the adulation, the approbation, the applause, and have God cheer you on and be lifted up. It's your choice. Even as a Christian, you know, you can, you can come in as the worthless servant, doesn't do much of anything, the diddly servant, what did you do? Well, God, I, I don't really have much to give you. Um, you know, all, all that you have is burned up. You're in, but you've got nothing. Now, um, Scripture tells us that everything that we're given, we're going to lay at His feet. I want to have something to lay before you. I want to have something to put down before my Maker's feet, before my Savior's feet, to honor Him. Okay? God will lift you up. Precious in God's sight is the death of his saints. Precious. Okay? I think I, I get these newsletters and these articles and I see the horrific things being done to brothers and sisters all across the world. And I'm a little ashamed at the offense that I have because they're limiting some of my freedoms here. Um, you know, oh, can't say this, can't do that. And, but uh, look, there's no police coming through the door. We're standing here worshiping God and I'm, I'm reading you out of His Word. And each of you should have a copy of it. And if you don't, there's one right in the chair in front of you. We all have it. There's nobody coming in trying to tear it up from our grasp and burn it. There's nobody coming in with batons to thunk us, to teach us the right way to do things. None of us are being carted off anywhere. I mean, most of us are thinking about going to lunch after. Not going to prison. Precious is in His sight. Now, does that mean we're any less? I think it's easier for us to stumble. I think it's easier for us to stumble, but we're, we're all in estimable trash. Jesus died for me and the comfort of the United States of America and the beauty of the Bitterroot Valley. He still died for me. My life was that important to Him. We thank God. Oh, we need to be thanking God that we have this freedom. But we also need to be lifting up our brothers and sisters that don't have that freedom. Praying for them. Interceding on their behalf. <clears throat> you know, it was in Revelation, it talks about the blood of the martyrs that are under the altar and they're calling out, how much longer must we, we, we wait? They are calling out for an end to this. God says, not long. <coughs> not long. You know, I don't know when it's going to happen. I don't know. I get very frustrated with people that try and figure out dates. I get really bothered by that. Okay? No one knows. 
But if each of us pick a number of days, one of us is going to get it right. That's not the point. The point isn't when. The point is that it is. But I'll tell you what. We're closer today than we were yesterday. <laughs> and we'll be closer tomorrow than we are today. be out in the field shoveling the grain into the master storehouse. <coughs> we need to be praying, God, we need more harvesters. We need more workers. We need to be praying, God, make me a suitable worker. <coughs> Help me, Father, to be a good servant. You can't be a good servant with pride. Humility. Let God lift you up. God isn't interested in putting your nose in the dirt and keeping it there. He's interested in making of you something better than you can ever make of yourself. He wants you to be the best you can be. The best noble object that you can be. Amen? Amen. Amen. Amen.